Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Following the announcement of his new cabinet, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau leapt to the defense of his former defense minister. Trudeau's new cabinet will be costing Canadians millions of dollars more. We hear from Franco Terrazano from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation who has the details. And some members of the Blood Tribe in Alberta have filed a judicial review against their chief and council. We will explain why. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he will continue to lead the Liberals the next time the Canadians head to the polls, which may be within the next year and a half. Following the announcement of his new cabinet, Trudeau also defended former Defence Minister Harjit Sejan as he shuffled him over to the international development portfolio. Minister Sajan has consistently been someone uh, who has been there to fight for the women and men who serve in our armed forces and to push back against the culture uh, that excludes, that marginalizes people. And I thank him for his leadership and his service there. And I'm excited about seeing the next steps that will be brought forward by Minister Anand. As you know, there are already a number of processes in place from uh, General Carignan uh, heading up uh, a specific, a specific uh, unit in the armed forces to draw together all concerns and resources. Anita Anand says her previous experience as procurement minister leading the charge for Canada's COVID-19 vaccine rollout will help her in her new role as Canada's defence minister. She also becomes our country's first female defence minister since 1993. I'm honoured that the Prime Minister has asked me to take on this role as a woman, as a visible minority and as a minister that has led uh, the largest inoculation campaign or at least the procurement of those vaccines in Canadian history. Um, but I, I want to say that I bring those qualities to bear to this role and uh, the fact that I'm a woman is I guess, one aspect of that calculation. Uh, but there are other areas of expertise that I will also be imparting to my role, including my expertise in governance and my knowledge of law and process. And uh, those are very important qualities, I think, in any job, but certainly in the task before us at DND. My top priority is to make sure that everyone in the armed forces feels safe and protected and that they have the supports that they need when they need them. Now, in a bit of an odd turn of events, both Premier Jason Kenney and opposition leader Rachel Notley agreed on something. They both felt that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau bringing on Stephen Guibault, a former Greenpeace Quebec activist, as the new environment minister is a bad move. Premier Kenny says he's worried that Guy Beau will impose a radical agenda that will further attack our energy sector and lead to more unemployment. NDP leader Rachel Notley agreed, saying she shares concerns about some of the positions Guy Beau has taken in the past, including being anti-pipeline. A new report by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation says the salary costs of the new federal cabinet have increased by $3 million since 2015. The federal director of the CTF, Franco Terrazano, says Canadians are paying for a much bigger and expensive cabinet right now, which won't do much to chip away at our country's debt, which is now over a trillion dollars. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau recently appointed 38 ministers to his cabinet with a salary cost of $10.8 million. That is $3 million more than his cabinet from just six years ago. Franco joins me now via Zoom from Ottawa. Now, Franco, did the prime minister offer an explanation for the big increase? It's simple math that really isn't going to be adding up for taxpayers, and it's because there's more ministers who are making bigger salaries, and that's why taxpayers are going to be on the hook for an extra $3 million in cabinet salary costs compared to Trudeau's first cabinet appointed back in 2015. So, Franco, what kind of money are we talking about when it comes to the prime minister's current salary, and what about his federal ministers? The prime minister is making 
$371,000. Ministers are making $274,000. So those are big salaries. But the real slap in the face for taxpayers is that all members of parliament received two pay raises while millions of Canadians struggled through the pandemic, which means that the prime minister is going to make an extra $13,800 compared to pre-pandemic, while ministers will make an extra $10,000 compared to before COVID-19. Thanks so much, Franco. That was Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, joining us from Ottawa. Well, the Trudeau Liberals recently announced that if you refuse to receive the COVID-19 vaccine and you lose your job as a result, you will not receive employment insurance benefits. Many Canadians have a problem with that, including political reporter Mr. Brian Lilly. This again goes against the caretaker convention because the government made this decision in between elections and they made it policy. So if you are terminated because you refuse to get vaccinated, the government is telling employers, put down, that you are fired with cause. Fired with cause normally means that, well, you're not meeting the terms of employment. Nobody had COVID-19 vaccination as a term of their employment if they were hired more than two years ago. Mr. Lilly will also have more details of how PM Trudeau's newly appointed cabinet is not good news for Alberta's energy sector. That's coming up right after business news. Well, we had some strong winds in the city once again today. Fortunately, they should be tapering off. Jeanette Rocher is here now with a quick look at the early weather forecast. Jeanette, it's not just the wind, but we may be seeing a little moisture heading our way as well. Yeah, well, we could be seeing a 30% chance of showers as early as tomorrow morning, Hal. I know earlier in the week, the prediction was that those showers weren't going to hit us till about Friday, but looks like we're getting an early present of showers, which could hit us late by tomorrow morning. Uh, the wind also a factor, as you mentioned this evening, those westerly winds hitting us at 40K, gusting to 60 at times. The wind should be sticking around for tomorrow, gusting to 40 kilometers per hour. As for the rest of the week, though, I will have those details coming up later in the show. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Three Blood Tribe members here in southern Alberta are not pleased with their council. The trio filed a judicial review into a vote that saw the approval of $150 million in cattle settlement money back in September. As Carson Marsuk explains now, they're concerned about how the ratification vote took place and who was in control of the money. Blood Tribe members Roger Prairie Chicken, Eugene Fotz and Lori Scout have joined forces with the Band Members Alliance and Advocacy Association of Canada asking the federal court to review a $150 million cattle settlement. But they were supposed to give reports to us on how much money we have, you know, they have spent, where the money went, you know, the accountability process. So what we believe is financial conflict has taken over and these things has to be reported to the people. The application says there was a lack of proper consultation with members before a ratification vote in September. The chief and council simply produced a summary of the agreement uh, insofar as what the terms and conditions are and basically they're saying just take our word for it and uh, we say that's not good enough. The settlement of $150 million would see each blood tribe member receive 3000 The group says there has been no clear answer as to where the remaining money will be used towards. They've established purportedly through this agreement to set up a, a trustee committee over the money. The problem with that is that seven of the trustees that are going to be overseeing this money, four of them, will be from the chief and council. So chief and council effectively has a monopoly over this money. This isn't the first time members have faced financial conflict. Some members say they have yet to receive a $2,000 payment from a settlement claim back in 2019. We need to see accountability and justice. And with what this, with this format that we're doing with this application, I do believe with BMAC, with, you know, with, with Orla, we're on the right track of moving forward for accountability and transparency for the reserves. Chief and Council have 10 days to file their intention to respond to the notice of application that was filed against them in the federal court. Bridge City News reached out to the Blood Tribe's communication department, but no one was available for comment. For Bridge City News, I'm Carson Marsuk. An Alberta teacher has started a project called Freedom Teachers. It consists of a group of educators who give their free time to support parents who have chosen to homeschool their kids. Christian Peterson is the founder and joined BCN's Jeanette Rocher to chat about it. Parents are just very happy that there's an alternative out there um, in terms of if they want to homeschool their kids and they're not familiar with the curriculum or what to do, we can connect them if they want to homeschool their kids and they want 
you know, to be connected with other parents, we can connect them. Um, we're just trying to build a large community across the province and across the country, hopefully, that is connected um, so that people don't feel like they're alone because no one should feel alone um, the way things are right now. And this is a really good opportunity through education to connect people through a common um, collective. Peterson says many of the teachers continue to teach full-time, but are still giving several hours in the evenings to help coach parents with curriculum and offer tutoring support to students. You can catch the full interview with Jeanette Rocher on the BCN Weekend Edition. Officials at Chinook High School in Lethbridge have apologized for a meme that was posted to social media. In the meme on Instagram, a list of costumes to avoid for Halloween were listed, and in the second paragraph, it included costumes depicting perpetrators of violence or oppression, which include Hitler, Ted Bundy, and the police. Now, Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Udorf shared the post to his Facebook page, saying the police officers should not be compared to perpetrators of violence and oppression, and certainly not listed in the same category as Adolf Hitler. An official from the Lethbridge School Division said the image shared by the Chinook Coyotes was taken from an account called the On Canada Project, which has no affiliation with the school. A fishy situation is going on at a few ponds around Lethbridge. Aquatic invasive species, including goldfish and koi, have become a real issue at Firelight Park, Chinook Lake, and Elm Grove's Pond. The species have been illegally released into stormwater ponds and other water bodies, altering aquatic habitats so that it becomes inhabitable for native populations. The City of Lethbridge's water and wastewater team will be taking inventory of the invasive species as a way to address the issue. So over the next couple of days, there'll be an inventory being taken of the types, uh, sizes, and quantities of invasive species that are currently in Firelight Park pond. It's a continuation of assessment that was taken last summer in July 2020 and so we're continuing that going forward in order to find out what is currently present so that next spring we can continue on and remove those invasive species from this pond. Now the city says if you find goldfish in your storm pond you can catch and dispose of them just don't release them back into the storm pond. If you walk near the beautiful Nikiyuko Japanese Garden in our city, you'll notice a brand new building that's being built right next door. As Mike Quinn explains, the new Nikiyuko Bunka Center is near a completion for a phase one opening on November the 26th. And the opening will coincide with the first night of the Winter Light Festival. The new Nikiyuko Bunka Center was approved in 2017 as part of the City of Lethbridge's 2018 to 2027 Capital Improvement Project. The center will allow the community to come for cultural purposes, events, and activities. The facility will include an exhibit space, two classroom and programming rooms, a cafe, and spaces that are available to rent for meetings and community events of up to 300 people. Staff from the Lethbridge and District Japanese Garden Society say the center is coming together on budget, which rolls in at a total of $2,920,000. The architecture for the center was completed by Songer Architecture based in Lethbridge. So just watching the framing going up was wonderful and that huge expanse of roof that continues out. You'll note that the two, the way the two bars open up for you to see the garden, this bar doesn't it keeps its shape and so you have that massive expanse because it kept its square shape. The Centre for Oral History and Tradition at the University of Lethbridge has taken charge of the Memory Capture Project, which is an interactive sound booth that will be placed inside the centre. People can go in and they can learn about the project, they can uh, listen to stories about um, Japanese Canadians here in the Lethbridge community or they can record their own memories and have them become part of our research project. There will also be karaoke and sumo wrestling packages and a new waterfall projection and koi pond will be built in the center for guests to enjoy. The Nika Yuko Japanese Gardens founders will also be featured through dedicated spaces and exhibits. And this is going to be a, a, a great place for um, uh, people to come and, and gather and to tour. It's really exciting. There will be three stages of opening for the center. The first being the gift shop, cafe, and event space opening on November 26th. And in early 2022, the exhibit and programming spaces will open. The third and final stage will be the official grand opening of the center, which will take place on July 14th. For Bridge City News, I'm Micah Quinn. When it comes to dealing with the current pandemic, many believe that God is in control. You can include Pastor Daniel Zabula in that group. Pastor Daniel is the founder and senior pastor of the Miss City Church here in Lethbridge. 
He says, even during this current pandemic, God has his hand upon it and will bring revival to our city and our country. This decade, you're going to see the unveiling of God's plan for this, uh, this city, this nation. You know, people said to me, oh, all of this, like we are, like what happened? We are losing our liberty. I'm telling you the truth. God's prophetic destiny over our nation, over our people, over the church, the nation called church, God's prophetic destiny is manifesting. The kingdom of God is advancing. Catch the full interview with Dr. Daniel Zabula and BCN's Jeanette Rocher coming up after business news. The chief of a Saskatchewan First Nation says a visit from the Pope would be a good step toward reconciliation. Chief Cadmus DeLorme with Cowessess First Nation responded to the announcement that the Pope is coming to Canada. DeLorme says the visit would have to come with an apology for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools. The Vatican says Pope Francis is willing to visit Canada, but no firm date has been set yet. Earlier this year, Cowessess announced the discovery of up to 751 unmarked graves at its former residential school site. The United States moved a step closer to expanding COVID-19 vaccinations for millions of children. Government advisors endorsed Pfizer's kid-sized doses for those 5 to 11. The FDA panel voted that the vaccine's benefits outweigh the risks. It's always nerve-wracking. I think when you're asked to make a decision for millions of children based on studies of only a few thousand children, you never know everything. The question is, when do you know enough? And I think we, we certainly know that there are many children between 5 and 11 years of age who are susceptible to, to this disease who could very well be sickened or hospitalized or die from it. At one point, we thought if we vaccinated enough people, that the, vac the virus would go away. It's not going away, and I think we're going to have to find a way to live with it. And I think the vaccines kind of give us a way to do that. It was on this day that U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt was born. Israel's Menachem Begin and Egypt's Anwar Sadat won the Nobel Peace Prize. And the Boston Red Sox won their first World Series since 1918. This is Today in History for October the 27th. <laughs> October 27th, 1787. In New York City, a newspaper publishes the first of the Federalist Papers. The series of essays by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay urges ratification of the U.S. Constitution. The following year, the Constitution becomes law of the land after nine of the then 13 states ratify it. 1858, also in the Big Apple, I am not leading this fight as a matter of aesthetic pleasure. I am leading because somebody must lead, or else the fight would not be made at all. President Theodore Roosevelt is born. The charismatic Rough Rider and his progressive policies help shape the modern presidency. 1978. And the winners of the Nobel Peace Prize for this year are Egypt's President Anwar Sadat, and Israel's Prime Minister Menachem Begin. Sadat and Begin share the honor for their progress toward achieving a Mideast peace accord. 1939. This parrot is no more. <laughs> he has ceased to be. John Cleese, actor and comedian, is born in Britain. He's best known as a member of the Monty Python comedy group, the TV series Faulty Towers, and the movie, A Fish Called Wanda. And 2004. We waited a long time for this, and it's about time it's here. Well deserved. Go Red Sox, 2004 World Series champion! A baseball curse is finally broken as the Boston Red Sox win their first World Series since 1918. They sweep the St. Louis Cardinals with a 3 to nothing shutout in Game 4. Today in history, October 27th. Ross Simpson, The Associated Press. The world's first ever stamp is going up for auction later this year. The unused penny black dating back to 1840 is part of a document to sell for up to 6 million British pounds. It is currently owned by Alan Holyoke, who paid just under 50,000 pounds for the stamp. It's part of a paper known as the Wallace Document. Holyoke spent three years proving the stamp's authenticity. It is a world icon. It's a world icon because it actually is the very first stamp. So it's a stamp that came from the very first sheet of stamps that were printed.
the value that's being put at the moment for the auction uh, of the Wallace document is in sterling uh, between four and six million. So it's a bit different to the price I paid. And I would be disappointed if it doesn't make far more than that. I should have held on to my stamps when I was a kid. Six million British pounds, could you imagine? Wow, hot stuff. Well, it was almost hot here today in the Windy City. We hit over 14 degrees, but a cooling trend is on the way. Full weather details are on deck. We've been receiving some fairly nice weather for the last week of October. In fact, we're even warmer than our average high for this time of year. Jeanette Rocher is back with a full look at the weather forecast. Jeanette, it should be cooling off, however, with a chance of showers on the way. Well, it didn't seem like we were going to get there today, but we did actually reach above our seasonal average, uh, also above our high today. So high today was 12, but we actually reached 14 degrees. Uh, overnight low this evening, 3 degrees. The wind is still going to be a factor overnight and into tomorrow, gusting to 40 kilometers per hour. 30% chance of showers uh, reaching us by late tomorrow morning. Uh, 13 degrees the high, uh, not too bad though. Into Friday, we're looking at a 60% chance of showers. We're going to see a drop in temperature. It's going to drop fast too. So seven degrees the high for Friday into single digits for the rest of the weekend. Uh, Saturday sunshine five, six degrees on Sunday, and then a jump back up to 14 degrees for Monday and Tuesday. So we are kind of seeing temperatures dropping and climbing all over the place. Average high for this time of year, as mentioned, 11 degrees. Uh, minus two is our low for this time of year. 25 is where we were at back in 1944. And in 1939, we were at minus 19 degrees. 812 is when the sun rose this morning. Our sun set this evening, 618 p.m., giving us just a little more than 10 hours of daylight. A rainfall warning in effect for the West Coast, looking at 20 to 30 millimeters of rain tomorrow for both Victoria and Vancouver. 14 the high in Victoria tomorrow. Vancouver sitting at 10, 9 degrees in Edmonton with lots of sunshine, 10 degrees in Calgary. Calgary seeing a chance of showers or possibly even some flurries tomorrow. So there you go. Those could be the first flurries of the season. Uh, sunshine in Saskatoon tomorrow, 10 degrees the high, 9 the high in Regina. Both of those cities uh, with the wind at 20 to 40 kilometers per hour, 10 degrees the high in Winnipeg tomorrow, but a mix of sun and cloud. As we look to the central part of the country, we're seeing a high of 13 in Toronto with a mix of sun and cloud. Nine degrees is the high tomorrow in Ottawa with mainly cloudy skies, 11 the high in Montreal with a mix of sun and cloud. As we look to Atlantic Canada, we're gonna be seeing wind factor is in uh, all of the cities there gusting to 50 kilometers per hour for pretty much all of these Atlantic cities tomorrow. Uh, mix of sun and cloud in Fredericton, 11 degrees the high, 10 degrees the high in Halifax, two to four millimeters of rain expected tomorrow, mainly cloudy skies in Charlottetown with a high of 10 degrees and five expected to be the high in St. John's Newfoundland with a chance of shower. So there you go, that is your forecast. Bank of Canada Governor Tim Macklem says inflation will remain higher for longer. He says it is mainly due to global supply chain problems, which pose a challenge for many households. He also says we could see an interest rate hike sooner than expected and that the bank is ending a key stimulus program known as quantitative easing or QE. We know higher prices are challenging Canadians and making it harder for them to cover their bills. I want to assure you that inflation is not going to stay as high as it is today, even if it's going to take somewhat longer to come down. The Bank of Canada is committed to ensuring that the price increases we're experiencing today, today don't become ongoing inflation. So far, measures of medium to long-term inflation expectations remain well anchored on the 2% target, and overall wage pressures remain moderate. This suggests that the higher prices, higher prices are not becoming embedded in expectations of ongoing inflation. A Google program that pays media companies for news went live in our city on Wednesday. Cash began flowing to 11 publishers who've also been given the ability to boost the positioning and look of their stories through the Google News Showcase. Google pays a licensing fee to be able to highlight articles the publishers select to be part of the program, which sometimes include paywall pieces they allow some readers to view for free. Higher prices for trucks and SUVs helped General Motors post a $2.4 billion third quarter profit despite factory closures due to a shortage of computer chips and other parts. Profit, however, was still 40% lower than the $4 billion GM made during the same period last year. The company says it lost considerable market share in the United States, its most profitable country. 
Company officials say the shortage of semiconductors plus COVID-19 outbreaks at supplier factories hit the company hard during the third quarter. Overall revenue fell 25% to $26.78 billion, which was well below analysts' expectations. Tech Resources is crediting strong commodity prices for a third quarter profit that came in 13 times higher than a year ago. The Vancouver-based miner says it had a record profit for the quarter of $816 million. That is up from $61 million in the same quarter last year. Revenue jumped more than 73% to $3.97 billion as realized copper, zinc and steelmaking coal prices all increased. On an adjusted basis, Tech says it earned $1.88 per diluted share. That beat analysts' expectations by 38 cents. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 218 points in the day to finish at 20,955. The Dow was down 266 points to 35,491. The S&P 500 was down 23 points to 4,552. And the NASDAQ was up just under a point to 15,236. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down $1.99 to $82.66 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 32 cents to $6.20 US. Gold was down 5 cents to $17.96.76 US an ounce. And silver was even on the day at $24.06 US an ounce. Wheat is at $11.57 per bushel. Barley's at $9.25. Canola's at $22.11. And corn is at $10.21 per bushel. Live cattle were up 40 cents to 127.23. Feeder cattle were up 53 cents to 156.50. And lean hogs were down 60 cents to 71.98. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 80.92 US. Recapping one of our top stories this hour, well, we just had the unveiling of the Trudeau Liberal Cabinet, and the new cabinet, according to the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, will cost taxpayers $3 million more compared to the 2015 cabinet when Trudeau first became Prime Minister. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau appointed 38 ministers to his new cabinet with a salary cost of $10.8 million. You know, there are a lot of concerns in our energy sector with a couple of recent picks RPM made for his new cabinet. Political reporter Brian Lilly will fill us in shortly. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau swore in his new cabinet recently, and there was a major cabinet shuffle. To discuss this in more detail is Toronto Sun columnist and one of our regular contributors, Mr. Brian Lilly. Now, Brian, one of the most notable moves was Harjit Sejan, who was criticized for his handling of sexual misconduct allegations in our military, is leaving the defense portfolio and moving on to international development. Quite a demotion for him, but I think he should have been demoted straight out of cabinet. This is a man who was in charge of one of our major institutions, the Canadian Armed Forces. When he first took over the post in 2015, there was a fresh report, the Deschamps report, saying there are problems of sexual misconduct in the military. This is something that the previous government had been made aware of. They hired the former Supreme Court justice to do a report. It was tabled with the government just months before the election. And there were promises made by both the Harper Conservatives before they lost power and the Trudeau Liberals after they took power that they would act on this report. And of course, nothing happened except more reports, more Supreme Court justices hired to tell the government what to do. Harjit Sejan was made aware of issues with the former chief of defense staff and didn't do anything except tell the prime minister's office, which told him not to do anything. So Anita Anand is now in. She is well-known to Canadians by now because she's been in charge of what we used to call public works, uh, now public works and procurement. So she's been in charge of getting all the vaccines for Canadians and has done, uh, you know, she appears to be a very competent job. She's been placed in charge. But that doesn't matter unless the prime minister's office gives her the ability to go in and make the changes necessary because at the end of the day, it's up to the prime minister whether these changes, including having a completely independent investigative body to look into claims, whether that actually moves forward or not. And so far, he has not been willing to allow that to happen in the military. It has to happen if we're going to move past this shameful period in our military history. But uh, he's shown no willingness to do it. He said the right words. Now we need to see action. 
Brian, there are lots of concerns with Stephen Guibault being appointed as Environment Minister and Jonathan Wilkinson as Natural Resources Minister. Apparently the two are anti-oil and gas. Is this really a declaration of war on our energy sector? I would say that beyond oil and gas, which is, you know, this sector is already on edge with the Trudeau government. Anyone involved in natural resource extraction, uh, natural resources processing in this country, I'd even go as far as to say agriculture and agri-food, so farming and fishing, you need to be concerned with these guys in charge. Stephen Guibault was a Greenpeace activist. I think I've told you the story of the first time I met him about 20 odd years ago in Montreal, chained up to a a gas pump at an Esso station in downtown Montreal. Uh, he's famous uh, for having been arrested climbing the CN Tower. He is someone who is fully on board with the Greenpeace ethos and worked in that area for decades before joining the Trudeau Liberals. Jonathan Wilkinson is someone who has shown that he is on board with the Prime Minister's uh, viewpoint on these things. Now, there's a lot of talk about how Trudeau cabinet ministers are really just figureheads that you know, concentration of power, which has been going on for decades, slowly eroding from cabinet ministers into the PMO, that does it really matter who's in charge? But Trudeau in appointing Gibo especially is signaling that he is fully embracing this way of thinking on the environment. And so if you're in the oil and gas sector, if you're in mining, if you're in forestry, you better be worried because just look at what Greenpeace has posted on their website and expect that to be the next policy pronouncement from the Trudeau government. Now, if you like drama, Brian, forget about watching a television program. Instead, maybe watch what's unfolding with Rogers Communications and the saga surrounding its ousted leader, Edward Rogers. What's the latest here? And will it impact Rogers' attempt to try and sign some big name free agents in the offseason for the Toronto Blue Jays? I knew you were going to bring it back to the Blue Jays. You know, Rogers is not only a, a major cable company, they're a cell phone provider across the country. They're into, um, you know, home security systems. They own media outlets across the country, radio and television stations. And of course, yes, they own the Blue Jays outright. They're also equal partners with Bell Media in uh, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Leafs, the Raptors, uh, Toronto FC, and a bunch of minor league teams. So, these guys are players that touch every corner of the country. And Ed Rogers, you said he's the ousted chairman. He would tell you he is the chairman of Rogers and that it's the other people who are gone. This is a saga that beats secession. If you've watched that hit TV show about a fictional TV, uh, family owning a, a media conglomerate, this beats it. Uh, although one of the participants in the saga, Martha Rogers, sister of Ed Rogers, says it's more like Game of Thrones. And she and her mother have said that they are going to spend every penny necessary to defeat Ed. I mean, what a setup uh, going on here, Hal. So earlier this week, on Tuesday, Ed Rogers went to the uh, BC Supreme Court because Rogers, Rogers is registered as a company in British Columbia, believe it or not. That's where they're uh, set up. So he filed papers there saying he is the legitimate chairman and his handpicked uh, board of directors are the board members. He cites a, a statement that his mother made at a board meeting back in September backing him. She, in a statement, uh, said to me that, no, uh, this is, he gave me a statement that wasn't true. Once I realized what he was doing, I changed my mind. His sister says that uh, he's not telling the truth. This is a, an incredible saga that matters greatly because, you know, beyond the, the salacious details of it, we're talking about a company with more than 25,000 employees, uh, more than 10 million customers, 14 billion in revenue last year. This is a big deal, even for people's pension plans. You know, a lot of people who have index funds are going to have Rogers in their pension plan. Well, their stock has gone down dramatically. As a result of this, as investors step back and say, well, wait a minute here, what have I gotten myself into? And I think a lot of uh, family members in and around the Rogers clan are wondering the same thing. Interesting to see how it unfolds. And like I said, if it does impact Rogers' opportunity to try and sign some of those big name Blue Jays, like maybe Marcus Simeon, Robbie Ray, maybe some other free agents. Brian, last week the Trudeau Liberals announced the end of the old support systems and a new group of programs to help individuals and businesses. Now, you're one of the few who say that the government should not be doing this when Parliament is not sitting. Why is that? 
Well, when Parliament's not sitting in between elections, and especially in between cabinets, it's supposed to be a, what's called the caretaker convention. Last week, there was no new cabinet sworn in. Parliament is not resuming until November 22nd. And yet they announced new programs and $7.4 billion in new spending. Now, this wasn't a typical government announcement of, down the road, we plan on doing great things and you will hear from us in due time. No, it was, we're going to spend $7.4 billion and it starts on Sunday. So these programs took effect this past Sunday. The spending started this past Sunday. Parliament's not in session. No MP has voted on this. How are they getting around the fact that Parliament hasn't voted on such massive spending? The vote on the previous programs allowed the government certain leeway to extend them, but it didn't say that they could wholesale change them or bring in new programs. So in order to continue this, Parliament resumes on November 22nd. Their authority to spend on the old programs ends November 20th, so two days before MPs return. The first week of Parliament, you've got to elect a speaker, you have to have a speech from the throne, you have to set up committees, you have to elect committee chairs, all of these things have to happen before Parliament can operate. And then they've got just days to vote on $7.4 billion in new spending. This is an affront to democracy, Hal. I had former liberal MPs and senators write to me about how offended they were by this, that this is horrible, that it's not being called out. Um, Beyond that, you know, but, and there, should, there shouldn't be a beyond that. This should not be happening. But if the liberals say, well, we're still giving MPs a vote, yet yeah, you're getting a vote with a gun to your head because these programs will already be in existence and you're going to have to say to people, if you vote them down because they're bad, this is why we stop them. If you think back to the beginning of the pandemic, the liberals brought in wage subsidies and, and supports for Canadians that were poorly designed and they had to be redrawn at the insistence of the opposition parties. All the opposition parties played a role in improving the programs. There's nothing to think that these new programs won't need improvement. They won't have time to consider them. They won't have time to hear from witnesses. They won't have time to debate. It will be vote on this now or Canadians will go hungry before Christmas. Now, another change the Trudeau Liberals made was that people who lose their jobs for not being vaccinated will be denied employment insurance payments. Now, many argue that this action the government is taking is spiteful and petty. What are your thoughts? I think it's spiteful and petty. Look, the, the, the government is firing or threatening to fire workers who are working from home in their basements, on their dining room tables, people who aren't coming into contact with others. There could be a valid reason and a, you know, a debate around should a surgeon who's going to operate on someone who's immunocompromised and they're going to cut them open, have their body fully open, and that person's not vaccinated, should they be doing that? At that point, we can have a real serious debate. But does Jane, the accounts clerk, who works in her basement and hasn't worked in an office for almost two years, does she really need to be fully vaccinated or face termination? And then if she faces termination, you're not going to grant her uh, employment insurance. This, again, goes against the caretaker convention because the government made this decision in between elections and they made it policy. So if you are terminated because you refuse to get vaccinated, the government is telling employers, put down that you are fired with cause. Fired with cause normally means that, well, you're not meeting the terms of employment. Nobody had COVID-19 vaccination as a term of their employment if they were hired more than two years ago. So there's gonna be a legal fight on this. There's already a, a temporary injunction that'll be decided later this week over terminated health workers in Toronto. We'll see where that goes. Brian, inflation continues to spike here in our country. Gas here in southwestern Alberta is a buck forty-five nine a liter. It's gone up exponentially. It's gone up incredible. I know on the west coast, I think they're like a dollar seventy-five a liter. Last week, Stats Canada reported a monthly inflation rate not seen since February of two thousand and three. Are there any signs the government will take steps to properly deal with this? Not at this point. Um, and, and look, that four point four percent inflation hike that Stats Can reported for September didn't wasn't due to gas going up because throughout the month of September, we saw a big spike in gas over the summer and then it kind of plateaued throughout September. 
uh, it's now in October started to go up again. So that 4.4% was based on food, appliances, housing, clothing, all of these other factors that they measure. It's going to be worse for October because gas has started to go up again and nothing else has slowed down. There's two ways that the federal government could deal with this. One, they could rein in their own spending because out of control government spending, this deficit spending that they're in does help drive inflation. The other thing would be to have the Bank of Canada raise interest rates both of which are seen as potentially also hurting the economy, could hurt Canadians. We could see interest rates, uh, mortgage rates go up, credit card rates go up. But if we don't have that, then every, you know, it's called the invisible tax because the price of everything's going up and you're not getting anything more in return for it. So this is a horrible situation that we're in. Canada is not alone or unique, but we may be alone and unique in not wanting to do anything to fight back against it at this point. That was political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly. Thanks so much for your time today. Many would like to see revival take place in our Canadian cities and towns, but what would it take to see this actually happen? It doesn't just happen all by itself. Well, joining me to discuss this is Dr. Daniel Zapula. He's the pastor of Mid City Church in Lethbridge and the founder of Bridges of Hope Ministry, which is a humanitarian organization that empowers those in need around the globe. Quite a worthy cause, I would say. Welcome to Bridge City News, Dr. Zapula. Uh, it's great to have you back on again. Well, thank you. It's good to be back and to join you in this conversation. Awesome. So what do you think it would take to see a city transformed? Some people say it can't be done without an ongoing prayer movement that prepares the way. So what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think it, it, it begins with a city. Notice this, this sense of a city church. It begins with a community, a neighborhood of people that gathers together. You know, revival doesn't happen until people begin realizing that they are a community in the first place. And if you were to think about the early church and some of the things that took place is that when people were gathered in one accord and that they were together, you see, I mean, God had decided that revival will never manifest outside of our connection. You see, it's when we are connected with God and connected to one another in the, it's, it's in that connection, in those connections, that we see the incredible manifestation of God's grace. Hmm. That's amazing. So any ideas to where Lethbridge is at when it comes to this uh, connection or to prayer, so to speak? Yes. And, and, and I think it's quite important that we just say that revival happened in the midst of a connection. You know, when people are recognizing themselves as one you know, with one accord, one heart. And, and I said in the early church, we walk together. Now, in the city of Lethbridge, I think we have just been, just, we're coming through a pandemic and, and something that is quite important that uh, at least for my generation, this is like, uh, it's like equivalent to what other people experienced during the first world war or the second world war. And there's quite a lot of things happening. And, and I think uh, from my point of view, I, I, I see that as a city, we have gone through a lot of like a division. You know, people are divided, people are fractured, and and, and so community are, are, are so just divided in a sense. But uh, from my point of view, as I look at our city, I look at the dynamic that it's going through, I think actually we are coming good together. It's like the first hit really, it just split us. And now we are coming back together as one. And I actually am saying that in the next couple of years, you're going to see some incredible move happening in this city, at least from my standpoint, what I'm witnessing and the kind of activity I'm taking part of. Uh, a re revival is really here at our door. This, I think in my lifetime, at least in this city, I don't, I, 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 I have never seen, and I don't think I will ever see a greater opportunity than this moment and this time. And that's why I, I said yes to taking part in this conversation. Oh, that's amazing. So where do you think that we're headed over the next, so basically you think that we're in better shape now than we were before, like say 10 years ago in that aspect? Well, yes, because uh, it, I, I think I think so, because this experience of going through this pandemic brought us together. 
it made us realize that we actually need one another, that we need, I need you, you need me, and we are brothers and sisters. And it is in that environment that I believe God will move. 10 years ago, you know, we are all complacent, building our own homes, building our own communities, building our own institutions. Now we are beginning to question what we have been build, building. Now we are wondering, where, are we building God's house, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle? And that question mattered more than the answer. And so right now I, I am part of a, a group. I'm, a, I'm sitting on the board of the Leftbridge House of Prayer, Jennifer Thomas and her team. They are doing an incredible job. They're pulling people from all backgrounds together and there's more prayer we have like ladies and gentlemen participating in prayer you know prayer evenings and uh, we we have people with burdens coming and and seeking the lord's help and, and and it's more and more people are realizing that the answer is not in our technologies it's not in our science it's not in our abilities or disabilities that the answer is actually in the lord visiting a church and a community. And that's what revival really is. It's not the community trying to make something happen. It's not, that's religion. You know, revival is about God touching and coming upon a community. People who otherwise would have felt that they are nothing, I'm nobody. And, and God's presence up, upon them, redefining them and rewriting uh, uh, the mandate of their lives and telling them, you are a somebody because I have touched you. I have ministered to you. And I am just so excited and I'm anticipating a visitation of God, his power and his Holy Spirit in our lives that we've, that in ways we have never seen before. You know, here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing more people uh, give their lives to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing more people joining and uh, gathering together in homes. You know, that's really, really good. It's no longer about institutions. Eh? This is about people who genuinely just want to connect with one another. You know, when I, I want to connect, I want to be with you, you want to be with me. And in the presence of two and three, guess what? There is something powerful. When two or three are gathered, he said, I am there. And that is what is exciting me in this city. Yeah, it's really cool that you say that because we're talking about pandemic and pandemic has it's caused so much division, like you said, but then you're also saying that this was a time that you're seeing a revival like no time before. So it's almost like in dark times, that's when uh, God's spirit really shows up. So where do you think things will go in the next decade though? Do you, do you see it going up again or is it kind of a... <laughs> goes it goes up and down in waves that's such a great question you know what i when i look at where we are now i say if you really if you are a reader of history you go back to the third century you know what we are witnessing what we are going through is exactly the same things that they have been through that this was a century before uh, the the apostle the creation of the apostle creed you see, it is really moments like the third century set the church up to define itself. And I just believe that this decade is a decade of redefinition of us reaffirming who we truly are. And not only that, it's a decade for us to see God do so much in our life because we have done too much for God. And I think uh, uh, we now want to see God do for us. You know, sometimes we are so obsessed and drunk with that, uh, that and, and delirious with that desire. I got to do more for God. I got to do this for God. And so much that we forgot about experiencing God who is there with us, walking with us. God is saying, see what you can do. Hey, it's not much. But look at what I can do with one person devoted. And that is what I'm seeing, that uh, the presence of God and the way God will move in the life of people. It's not the end of the church. In fact, the church is like, it's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. It's not what you can see. The church is bigger, it's growing. And, and that's what I'm so excited about. I'm telling you this decade, you're gonna see the unveiling of God's plan for this, uh, this city, this nation. 
you know, people said to me, oh, all oh, this, like, we are, like, what happened? We are losing our liberty. I'm telling you the truth. God's prophetic destiny over our nation, over our people, over the church, the nation called church, God's prophetic destiny is manifesting. The kingdom of God is advancing. And that's the mystery of it. And I am so excited. I'm glad I'm alive you know, to witness this. And, and, and I hope that your listeners really can also feel the sense of excitement in the air. I'm just a bushman in this place and I can see it. Hmm? I can see it. And I just, I, I, I pray, my prayer for people that you awaken to, to that reality. Mm -hmm. Now you'd mentioned the, the church and what it's becoming. So, I mean, right now it seems like the church typically is no longer that main hub that people, people go to to get their needs met or to go to for fellowship. Uh, we're particularly seeing this in some Canadian cities. But do you think that there's an expectation that the government is there to supply our needs, especially during, like we were talking about the pandemic, during these kind of heavy times? Uh, what do you think about that? Wow, that's a very, very incredible uh, question. Thank you for asking that. The sense that, yes, there is a thought that the church was the hub. But actually, before the pandemic, the church was not the hub. <laughs> and I think, he, here's the thing, is um, we, we are mistaken sometimes to think that the church or our church is the center of activity. I'm telling you, the city is moving on. Like the, the church of God, the church has moved in the street. It's just the time for the institution to catch up to where church is going, in the street, in the highways and the byway, in mission field, in and around the world and our neighborhood. You see, because God is in the neighborhood. God is knocking at the heart of people. Church like is, is where two or three are gathered. It's in your family. It's in your home. It's in your heart. It is, you know, I'm a, sanctu like, I, 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 I'm a sanctuary. I know that's where God, a tabernacle, a place where God lives in me. So I think uh, for us, for many of us, it's just a cultural change. We just, we, we just need to have that change. You know, around the world in China, in the places where revival is breaking, they don't have any like big building where they go and, and gather. You know, in, 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 my, in Burkina Faso, in some of the neighborhood, like they are being attacked by jihadists and the church is growing. It's, it's incredibly advancing. And you know what? They're not gathering around building beautifully lush building of red carpet and no, and people coming there and lifting their hand up. No, people are out there in the bush and they're encountering God, his angel, his power, revival have hit the street. And that's what I'm saying. It's just about time for the church to really get out and be the church because God is not coming. Jesus is not coming for a defeated church, for a shame church. He's coming for a victorious church, a church without spot, without wrinkle. And I'm so glad to be a leader in this church. You know, looking at Jesus, who is a shepherd of us all. So I'm excited. My sister, like, what a great question. Right now, temporarily, for our physical need, it seems like, wow, we need the government to hold our hand. We have realized the government brought a few dollars and there's no money anymore. I don't, I, 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 I don't, I don't particularly think that people are really necessarily looking uh, really more and more to government for their solution. You know what is happening? You know, as a result of the business uh, of, of revival, is that people are starting new business. Whenever revival hit, churches grow, business thrive, people are taking initiative locally. And continentally, transcontinentally, you see, whenever revival hit, you know, people are using business as a mission. People are creative. The, the, the ingenuity in us that is like that alive, something just flip, uh, just on again. We are back online. Business like is so, so, so good. That business, new businesses are starting. People are creating new things. And that's what I'm trying and telling you. You know, if a listener can pay attention to what's going on, the government will not save us. You know, it's a, we, you, anybody who believes the solution is in government is deceived and you, you need a wake up call and you need to come, like just, I was going to say you need to go to church. No, I'm the, <laughs> or you need to come to Jesus. But the truth of the matter is that the solution is not in government. Ask the government. They will tell you the solution is not in government. The solution is each one of us waking up and being the church and becoming the church and living that 
like right now, I'm living by faith. I'm trusting the Lord for provision, for miraculous provision. I'm trusting God for a visitation. You know, marriages are breaking down. I know that. But you know what? It's just, I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit will visit us. This time, like marriage didn't break down because of a pandemic. We were broken down before. Now the pandemic just made us realize what, it, what we had. You know, it came to the surface and now we can see it. Now I, I wrote a book on marriage because I truly believe God will restore marriages and families. You know, churches are being rebuilt, communities rebuilt, leadership is getting in place. Oh, my sister, you get me excited. Don't get me I preaching. I was just going to say, I can see that the revival is building up in you. You're on fire. <laughs> Your energy is uh, contagious, Daniel. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're almost out of time, but we appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you so much for this moment, and we'll see you again. Dr. Daniel Zopula is the pastor of Mitz City Church in Lothbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks for watching.